Hi guys! Welcome to another episode of Attorney Javier Law Vlog. Today we continue with our discussion on the law of agency and specifically we'll be talking about the obligations of the principal. So if you like my videos and you want to see more, please hit the subscribe button. Also, please remember that this is only for educational purposes and is not a substitute for proper legal advice or for studying and understanding the law. A like on this video or any of my other videos would also be greatly appreciated. Okay, so now let's begin. So in the previous episode, we discussed the obligations of the agent to the principal. And today, we'll be talking about the obligations of the principal to the agent. Okay, now let's begin with the first obligation of the principal to the agent, which is found under Article 1910. Under this article, the, the principal has the obligation to comply with all the obligations which the agent may have contracted within the scope of his authority and in the name of the principal. Remember that the essence of agency is a representation, meaning that the agent should act on behalf of the principal. And as long as the agent acts on behalf of the principal and not in his own name and also within the scope of the authority granted, then the agent will bind the principal to the obligation with the third person and now the principal must comply with such obligation. In case there is a defect in the elements, such as when the agent acts outside the scope of his authority, then the principal will not be bound. Unless, of course, he ratifies the contract, in which case, the principal will now have to comply with the obligation. Further, under Article 1911, even when the agent has exceeded his authority, the principal is solidarily liable with the agent if the principal allowed the agent to act as though the agent had full powers. And this is based on the theory of estopel and its purpose of imposing solidary liability upon both the principal and the agent is in order to protect innocent third persons, except of course where the agent had acted in good faith, in which case he will not be liable. The next obligation of the principal is found under Article 1912. And under this article, the principal has the obligation to advance to the agent should the agent so request, the sums or the money necessary for the execution of the agency. As mentioned in the previous episode, under Article 1884, the agent is bound by his acceptance to carry out the agency. And, by, and as such, the principal is under obligation to provide the means by which to execute the agency. And if the means to execute the agency are in the form of funds or money, then it is the duty of the principal to furnish such funds to the agent upon the request of the agent. And if the principal fails to furnish such funds, then the agent will not be liable for the damage which, through his non-performance, the principal may suffer. Okay? So generally, it is the duty of the principal to advance the necessary funds for the execution of the agency. And an agent has no duty to advance such funds unless there is a stipulation that he should do so. However, remember that even if there is a stipulation saying that the agent will advance the funds, the agent will have no obligation to advance the necessary funds when the principal is insolvent. In other words, in the absence of a stipulation that the agent shall advance the funds necessary to, to carry out the agency, then these funds must be advanced by the principal should the agent so request. Which brings us to the next obligation of the principal, which is to reimburse or indemnify the agent in certain cases, as provided for in Articles 1912 and 1913. Article 1912 provides that should the agent have advanced the funds necessary for the execution of the agency, then the principal is bound to reimburse the agent. 
even if the business or undertaking was not successful, provided that the agent is not at fault. Okay, meaning it was not the agent's fault why the business or undertaking was not successful. Now, what does this reimbursement include? The law says it will include interest on the sums advanced from the day on which the advance was made. So this is yet another obligation of the principal, also under 1912, to reimburse the agent for what the agent has advanced plus interest even if the business was not successful, provided that the agent was free from fault or was not at fault. 1913, on the other hand, speaks of the duty of the principal to indemnify the agent for all the damages which the execution of the agency may have caused to the agent, without fault or negligence on the part of the agent, of course. Since the principal receives the benefits of the agency, the principal should also answer for the damages resulting from the execution of the agency. Further, according to De Leon, Article 1913 is a logical corollary to the rule under Article 1884, which makes the agent liable to the principal for damages which the latter may suffer through the agent's non-performance or because of the agent's fraud or negligence. Therefore, in the absence of fault or negligence on the part of the agent, the principal must indemnify him. Take note, however, that the liability of the principal for damages is limited only to that which the execution of the agency has cost the agent and nothing else. In other words, if the damages were occasioned by the fault or negligence of the agent, then the principal has no duty to indemnify the agent. Now, what if the principal fails in his obligation to either reimburse the agent for the funds which the latter has advanced for the execution of the agency or to indemnify the agent for damages which the execution of the agency has caused him? Article 1914 serves as the agent's remedy. Okay, This is the remedy of the agent which is known as the agent's lien. Specifically, Article 1914 provides that the agent may retain in pledge the things which are the object of the agency until the principal effects the reimbursement of the funds, adv funds advanced for the execution of the agency under Art Article 1912 or pays the indemnity for damages which the execution of the agency has caused the agent under 1913. This agent's lien may be enforced in the same way as a pledge, subject of course to the new law, uh, Personal Property Security Act, which I have a playlist on. You can just check that out. No, The lien may enforce in the same way as a pledge, that is by having the property sold at public auction in the manner prescribed by law in order to satisfy his claim. Unlike contractual pledges, however, the agent is not entitled to the excess. Okay, he's not entitled to the excess in case the things are sold to satisfy his claim and the proceeds thereof are more than um, the amount due. Okay, take note also again huh, of the rules in the Personal Property Security Act which have repealed the laws on pledge and other personal properties given as security. Just check that playlist out. Now, take note under Article 1918, there are cases where the principal will not be liable for the expenses incurred by the agent. First, if the agent had acted in contravention of the principal's instructions, okay, meaning he acted contrary to what the principal said, unless the principal wishes to avail of the benefits derived from the contract, okay? So here, the purpose is to punish the agent unless the principal accepts the benefits, in which case it is implied ratification and the principal becomes liable for the expenses of the agent. Okay? The next case where the principal will not be liable for the expenses incurred by the agent is when the expenses were due to the fault of the agent. 
The next case is when the agent had incurred expenses with the knowledge that an unfavorable result would ensue. Okay? He knows that something unfavorable, that, that the result would be unfavorable. Okay? If the principal was not aware thereof. Here, the agent is guilty of bad faith because he already knows that an unfavorable result would ensue. Okay? He is guilty of bad faith and lack of diligence which breaches his obligation under Article 1888 which says that an agent shall not carry out an agency if its execution would manifestly result in loss or damage to the principal. For such breach, the principal is not liable for the expenses incurred by the agent. And uh, one more case is when it was stipulated that the expenses would be borne by the agent or that the agent would be allowed only a certain sum. So those are the cases where the principal will not be liable for the expenses incurred by the agent. Now, let's talk about the principal's obligation under Article 1875. Okay, which is to pay the agent the compensation agreed upon or if no compensation was specified the reasonable value of the agent's services if you remember my discussion in the first episode agency can be gratuitous or it can also be onerous meaning for compensation and under article 1875 an agency is presumed to be for a compensation unless there is proof to the contrary the principal must pay the agent the compensation agreed upon or the reasonable value of the agent's services if no compensation was specified provided of course that the agent has performed this obligation to the principal and when is compensation deemed earned if there is a stipulation then of course we follow that stipulation the parties may agree upon the time when the compensation shall be due okay but if there is no stipulation, then there is a need for either complete or at least substantial performance. Meaning that ordinarily in the absence of an express agreement as to when compensation is to be made, the duty on the part of the agent to carry out the agency must be performed before the right to compensation accrues. Trabaho muna bago bayad or work first before payment. And in this case, the question will now become, how do we know if the agency has been performed? The answer will depend on the intention of the parties. And there are two scenarios. Okay? First, if the result is not the basis for compensation but the rendition of the service itself, then proof of rendition of such service shall already entitle the agent to compensation. Example is where the agent's duty is simply to find a potential buyer for the principal's property. The fact that the agent produces such buyer is enough to entitle him to compensation even if the principal ultimately does not enter into a contract of sale with such buyer. Second scenario, but if the result is the basis of the compensation, meaning it's dependent on uh, earning results, then the rendition of the service without achieving the desired result will not entitle the agent to compensation. So in the previous example, if the duty of the agent is not only to find a willing buyer, but to make sure the buyer enters into a sale with the principal, then the agent will only be compensated upon the creation of the sale. This discussion brings us to the doctrine of efficient procuring cause, which states that in order for an agent to be entitled to a commission, he must be the procuring cause of the sale, meaning that the measures employed by the agent and the efforts the agent exerted must result in the intended contract of the principal, for example, a sale. In other words, an agent receives his commission only upon the success of the duty assigned to him. Okay? He has to succeed in what has been tasked or uh, assigned to him. Okay? Conversely, 
if the agent's efforts are unsuccessful or there was no effort on the part of the agent, then he is not entitled to a commission. Again, in the context of a sale, in order for an agent to be entitled to a commission, he must be the procuring cause of the sale, which simply means that the measures employed by him and the efforts exerted must result in the sale. This is under the case of Ramos v. Court of Appeals. However, take note of the case of Prats v. Court of Appeals, which says that for the purpose of equity, an agent who is not the efficient procuring cause is nonetheless entitled to his commission where he, notwithstanding the expiration of his authority, meaning it lapsed na, nag-deadline na, okay? He nonetheless, the agent nonetheless took diligent steps to bring back together the parties, the principal and the buyer, such that a sale was consummated even though his authority was terminated, Okay? So he will be entitled to a commission in that case. This was re reiterated in the case of Manotok versus Court of Appeals, where it was held that the proximate, close, and causal connection between the agent's efforts and the principal sale of his property cannot be ignored. And so the agent was held entitled to his commission. Now, still on the topic of uh, compensation, we distinguish between a broker and an agent. Okay, those, are, those two are different. A broker is generally defined as one who is engaged for others on a commission negotiating contracts relative to property with, with the custody of which he has no concern. Okay? He is, a he is a negotiator between other parties. He never acts in his own name but in the name of those who employed him. He is strictly a middleman and for some purposes, the agent of both of the parties. A broker is one whose occupation is to bring parties together in the matter of trade, commerce, or navigation. So, an agent, on the one hand, is duly authorized to enter into juridical acts on behalf of the principal. On the other hand, a true broker is merely an intermediary or middleman between the parties and he has no power to enter into a contract on behalf of any of the parties. The essential feature of a broker's conventional employment is merely to procure a purchaser for a property okay, who is ready and able and willing to buy at the price and on the terms mutually agreed upon by the owner and the buyer. This distinction is important. Why? To determine the entitlement of a broker to a commission even if he has no active part in the negotiations. Following the case of Medrano versus Court of Appeals, it is not a prerequisite to the right to compensation that the broker conducts the negotiations between the parties after they have been brought into contact with each other through his efforts. Brokers are entitled to their commission because they are instrumental in the sale of the property if they were the efficient procuring cause of the sale. This means that the broker's acts must be the proximate cause originating in a series of events which, without break in their continuity, result in the accomplishment of the prime objective of the broker, which is to produce a ready, willing, and able buyer for the owner's property. A broker will be regarded as the procuring cause of a sale and therefore entitled to a commission if his efforts are the foundation on which the negotiations resulting in a sale are begun. The broker must be the efficient agent or the procuring cause of the sale and the means employed by him and his efforts must result in the sale. He must find the buyer and the sale must proceed from his efforts acting as a broker. The case of Tan versus Gullias teaches us that an agent receives a commission upon the successful conclusion of a sale while a broker earns his pay merely by bringing the buyer and seller together even if no sale is eventually made. 
Now, let's move on to uh, the next obligation of the principal. In case of uh, in, in case there are two or more principals, we follow Article 1915 which says that if two or more persons having appointed an agent for a common transaction or undertaking, then they shall be solidarily liable to the agent for all the consequences of the agency. In order for the principals to be solidarily liable, the agent must have been appointed by all of the principals for a common transaction or undertaking. In other words, the requisites are first, there are two or more principals. Second, the principals have all concurred in the appointment of the same agent. And third, the agent is appointed for a common transaction or undertaking. If all the requisites are present, the liability of the principals would be solidary for all the consequences of the agency. In other words, each principal may be sued by the agent for the entire amount due and not just his proportionate share. Next, we'll move on to the liability of the principal for the agent's illicit or illegal acts. As a general rule, where the fault or the crime committed by the agent was not in the performance of an obligation of the principal, then the principal is not bound by the illicit or illegal act of the agent, even if it is not done with, in connection with his functions. However, there are exceptions. First, where the delict or quasi-delict was committed by the agent because of the defective instructions from the principal or due to the lack of necessary vigilance or supervision on his part, then the principal is liable for his own negligence. Second exception, when the agent secures a contract through fraud or makes a fraudulent alteration or executes a simulated contract, Okay, or a contract which does not exist. No? All of these acts are imputable to the principal as if done by him because the illicit act is inseparable from the transaction executed for, for him. Third exception, when the crime consists in the performance of an act which is within the powers of the agent but becomes criminal only because of the manner in which the agent has performed it. Then the principal will be liable to third persons who act in good faith. And finally, the last topic is the liability of the principal for the tort or quasi-delic of the agent. Under the principle of vicarious liability, the principal is civilly liable to third persons for torts or quasi-delics of an agent committed at the principal's direction or in the course and within the scope of the agent's authority. The agent is also liable with the principal and the liability is solidary. The requisites for vicarious liability are first, satisfactory evidence that the employee in doing the act of which the tort or quasi delict consists was motivated in part at least by a desire to serve his principal and second satisfactory evidence that the act of which consists the tort or quasi delict was not an extreme deviation from the normal conduct of such employee. And this is known as the motivation deviation test, which states that the bounds of the agent's authority are not the limits of the principal's tort liability, but rather the scope of the employment, which may or may not be within the bounds of authority. The scope of employment is much wider than the scope of authority, okay? So that's it for our discussion on the obligations of the principal. I hope you may have picked up a thing or two and I hope to see you next time guys. See you soon. Bye.